what's out there to protect them. There's just no will to make it happen. The navies of the world, actually Jacques Cousteau, one of the, you know, I actually did a Cousteau show on sharks a few years ago called Mind of the Demons. I never met Jacques, but all the others, you know, that were involved. And um, Jacques Cousteau said, fighting, you know, it was very hard during when he was alive, we always tried to have him do something environmental. And he was very, you know, he wasn't real environmental. I don't know. I don't want to smirch the man. But, you know, he was, he did it because, uh, you know, he, he liked to dive, <laughs> and he made money. And you know, they, the Cousteau organization in the old days had been known for doing a few kind of dastardly things with reefs and other situations that I don't want to go into. But the man was an icon, and he could have done huge things con for the conservation movement. And the one thing he did do, and the one thing he did say was, if the navies of the world stopped playing their petty little war games and actually did something useful, the oceans would be saved. And that is absolutely true. There are almost, the Sea Shepherd, we do all these things with Sea Shepherd, or, or I on my own sometimes. We're not in jail. You know why we're not in jail? Because we're not breaking any laws. The UN Charter for Nature, which we work under, and anybody can, and I'm about to do it on the reefs out here, says that if governments do not enforce laws on the seas, international regulations on the high seas, then non-governmental organizations can. It's got off, it gets us off all the time, because it is absolutely, it's written in the UN Charter for Nature. If you believe in the UN, I'm not a big fan of the UN, but I'm not a big fan of countries either, but they don't seem to get anything done is the only reason I'm not a big fan of the UN. They come up with great laws. There's great laws protecting everybody. But there's no one there to protect the laws, to make, to protect the things the laws are protecting from. In Canada, the Seal Protection Act, who does it protect? The sealers. Unless you're going to kill a seal, you can't get within a mile of it. Now, if you're going to kill it, walk right up and have a go. But if you're a per person like me, and you want to walk up and take a picture of the guy, you get arrested six times. Although the seventh time I didn't get arrested. You know what? I went to the Magdalen Islands and got a seal killing license. <laughs> and I had to take it, a seal killing class <laughs> with a bunch of I don't want to say this, but a bunch of drunk Canadians in an auditorium with a hockey stick beating up a, uh, a stuffed animal seal to show them how to kill the seal properly and then how to gut the seal properly like they learned anything. But they did get a piece of paper and it did give you the right to go up and kill a seal. I just said when I was arrested that time, I was trying to get it with my camera, but it kept getting away. And they had to let me off. I didn't get I didn't get charged. The, the judges looked at me, you know. That that was all there was to it. And actually, the Seal Protection Act, the sealing, in in part of my film, I was very controversial with environmental groups because in my discovery of I spent a lot of time saving seals. Um, I stayed and lived on the Magdalen Islands, which is one of the major sealing areas that they actually kill seals on. And I found out that on the Magdalen Islands, they didn't want to kill seals. Had nothing. They weren't making any money. I mean, Paul Watson was saying they were selling the penises for China for this is why they're killing seals, you know. But that was all just crap. They weren't. They actually were selling every part of the seal that they could. They'd get so much for the flippers and so much for the skin, but they couldn't make a living doing, it, especially for what going out in the ice. It's very dangerous. The Magdalen Islands usually, well, first of all, they lose, the last time I think they lost four boats or something. The last time I was up there, which is in 2005, I think four boats sank. The next year, I think they, they killed five or six people, um, the sealers themselves. I mean, these, these are little boats, and they're on the ice. And I don't know if you've ever been here. <laughs> Guys from Hawaii. <laughs> if you've ever been in the ice, or if you ever watched Whale Wars, I can tell you the ice can be kind of tricky. And, um, and they get crushed. So then it's not a big thing for them. What it is is it's recreation, number one. They live on a rock in the middle of Labrador, and it is frozen solid all winter long. And it's a small island, and by the time the spring comes, everybody's gone stir crazy, and those men want to get out of, away from their wives and drink beer with their friends 
as soon as they can. Four o'clock in the morning, they're down there drinking beer, watching the seals. I mean, it's all to watch the seals, of course. I went out, actually, I went out uh, a solid three weeks, and we walked out one time about 300 yards to try to kill a seal, and um, I talked them out of it. <laughs> so they weren't killing seals, they were partying. That's what they were doing. They were going to party. And why do they continue selling seals, and why does the Canadian government put up their they have a 300,000 quota this year, next year's 360,000, next year's 400,000 quota. That's because the seal, the baby seal, raises more money for environmental groups than any. If you look at even um, the, humane, the Humane Society commercials on TV, you have a baby seal. I mean, you've got to be kidding. Why? They have nothing to do with baby seals. But the anti sealing industry brought over $20 million a year to the Magdalen Islands and the Charlotte town for the three months, the three weeks of sealing. So they would not stop. They had no reason to stop. Even if they didn't kill seals, they just wanted to pretend to kill seals to get the environmentalists out there. Because the environmentalists rent every helicopter in all of eastern Canada. They had every hotel room booked. If you went into any restaurant in Charlottetown or any of those places, it was full of very, you know, people with real jobs that were actually eating real meals in the middle of winter when they had nobody there. And it was a major economic boost for the whole area, the seal hunt. It was also because the, uh, because the Canadian government, this is all part of my film, but because the Canadian government had banned cod fishing, these gentlemen were cod fishermen, the areas. But because they decided that all the cod was gone, you know, the Grand Banks, the greatest fisheries in the world, was dead. And that's only because, watched my film too, they let all, they banned the local fishermen with their little boats that would have had no, like, no problem with cod fishing and let the big factory trawlers from Spain, I mean, we were arrested for hitting a Cuban one. Um, I had to go to court in Spain first. We were whacking them out, trying to get people to pay attention. And we had blown up an engine, so we only had one engine, so we only could go to port. So we had like a big circle <laughs> that we were going, and we could only go at six knots. But we got out in the middle of all these trawlers. We were actually going our way to Norway, and we blew up an engine. We figured we got to do something. I mean, we're a small group. We have to get something out of this. And we were there in the middle of all these foreign trawlers. And so we decided to say, hey, these guys should, what are they doing out here? There's a cod fishing ban. The Canadians know they're here. The local fishermen don't know they're here. But they wouldn't know. But you know the government knows. They're there flying over them every day. So the government, Canadian government was allowing the fish to go to the foreigners. They weren't letting their own fishermen fish. So they were putting them out of work. And you know what? In Canada, you have to work 13 weeks a year to get unemployment. Seal hunt's 13 weeks. Government subsidized the seal hunt to allow the, the fishermen to get their 13 weeks of work so they could collect unemployment and be not be bums because the government had mismanaged the cod fisheries and put them all out of work to begin with. And now the environmental groups who were saying they were all feeling great, all these feel good things, and was raising all this money and everybody's going up there and you know we're filling the courts and we were filling the hotels. I had to rent a car. You know, I had to take a plane up there. I had to, you know, get out of court. I had to hire a lawyer. I had to pay $1,500 once for bail that I was never going to go back for. So when I came out my movie, I said, we should stop. All these environmental groups, actually, I came out with three ideas. The first one was canned because my first idea was, let's go to the Magdalen Islands, and I will rent a bar. And for the whole time of the, the seal hunt, I will give away free drinks. And I will rent a whole taxi service and so everybody can get driven home and no one dies in a car accident. And I'll guarantee you they will not go see them. Not one of them. Well, people flipped out because, you know, drunk driving and women against drunk, mothers against drunk. Oh, I mean, it was not politically correct. It would have worked, but it wasn't politically correct. So my next idea is I contacted all the environmental groups that were involved. And people kind of know me because I've been doing it longer as anyone else, and I'm kind of a jerk because I don't have a lot of loyalties except to the SEALs. So I have no trouble telling Paul Watson or Bob Hunter or any of the other ones off if, if I find them 
do me wrong, and I have no trouble going with a fisherman if I find they're doing things, you know, they're lying, like the seal penis thing. But, so I try to talk all these groups into let's, let's instead of, they were making huge amounts of money. I mean, I think Greenpeace, I, I was told $10 million. I mean, there was huge amounts of money getting involved in this. I said, so everybody can donate and we'll hire the local fishermen to build a hockey rink or a kid's playground or something for the whole two months around seal season. We'll hire everybody in the island. There's only, I mean, you could probably fit the English side of the island into this room. I went to their school play and it wasn't much bigger than this. There's, a, there's, there's the English side and the French side. They don't like each other, but, you know. So, they, the French are mostly the sealers. The English are more, uh, English speaking, uh, are more reasonable. But, you know, the French are kind of crazy and they're going to kill seals because guys from, from America might tell them not to. But they're certainly going to sell seals when it's bringing local economy up to a level that now they can survive better. They're taking people out, they're doing all that. So I asked all these people to donate the time and I actually went even to um, the Home Depot to see if they would donate the, uh, the materials. And Home Depot actually said they would. But you know, the environmental groups just about tarred and feathered me <laughs> and hung me out to dry. Because I became kind of, and I don't like to say this really, but it was a cash cow for everybody concerned. But since my film came out and it has played around and I made a big point that we were, as I said, I used the line Pogo, we have met the enemy and he is us. Um, and I'm actually doing a sequel to the film, that title, <laughs> We've Met the Enemy. Because with the whole media thing, I mean, that's, we have, we are our own enemy, obviously. I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of environmental groups out there. I actually am one of the few people that cross over and talk to the other group. I've never met anyone from Greenpeace who said anything nice about Sea Shepherd. I've never met anyone from Sea Shepherd that said anything nice about Greenpeace. And you know what it is? It's all about money. Because in order for me, if you're a rich guy and I'm going to come to you and get $10,000 to do this or that, you're going to say, well, you know, yesterday Greenpeace came. Didn't you? And I'm going to go, oh, Greenpeace, hell, they don't do anything. You don't want to give them the money. They're your, useless. So we can never get on. And it took me almost, my movie came out about four or five years. It took almost four or five years. I got Sea Shepherd not to go up to the seal hunt anymore. And if you notice, you don't hear much about it anymore. It's pretty much gone away. They don't seal hardly at all anymore. And I don't believe, after I let, lived there, that they seal hardly at all for the last 10 or 15 years. Because they haven't been able to kill white coats for almost 20 years. So even in my films, people were whacking the white coats. That hasn't happened. They outlawed that a long time ago. They knew that was killing them. Canadians knew that that picture was just killing them. So they outlawed it. Like pictures went away. Like anyone cared. This is the media, as I said. We're trying to win. We're not trying to tell the truth. You got to be kidding. The truth is for like scientists and and you know papers and you know. we're trying to win. And what we are such a small group that we had to win with public opinion. We have to make people care about the environment. We have to make them care about whales. That's quite easy. They're beautiful, huge animals. I mean, we in America, not only America, the world is spending millions and billions of dollars to try to talk to intelligent life on other planets. When we have one of the most intelligent beings right here on this planet, and we can't understand a word. Not a word. Now, whales can understand us sometimes. If you see, you can train them and do that kind of stuff. They can understand our language. We can't understand a word they say. And I was actually with Roger Payne. I don't know if Roger Payne is the uh, whale song guy, one of the scientists, quite an older man that's been around a million years. And I was asking Roger about the brain, because their brain's huge. On TV, said it was the size of a Volkswagen. I got like 16,000 calls telling me it wasn't. I said, I know it's TV. I know it's TV. But it's huge. And people, even Roger Payne, who's you know, a renowned scientist, wonders what they do with it. Well, nowadays, the, the newest, the, not the newest theory, the, the leading theory is they, uh, they process audio. I mean, we know that they can, uh, through their audio and through their, their <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> their songs, they can, they can hurt fish, they can see three-dimensional objects. We can't do that. 
they know that they can, I mean, what they figured out, now these figures might be wrong, but I'm going to make them up and stick by them. Um, <laughs> there, was a, there was a trivia question that I uh, answered correctly in this thing, and uh, only by guessing because I didn't know. But they asked how long whales can hear their own song, how far they can travel in unrestricted water. Well, it turns out that they can travel the exact circumference of the, United, of the world. Well, that was before. Nowadays, they say with, with motors and all the audio uh, interference and, and uh, you know, the Navy out here blasting them away. I don't know if you guys are involved in that or that issue. I've been hearing about it a lot. You know, they're testing acoustics and these whales are coming up. Some guy on uh, one of these islands thinks it's, it's taken out the coral because some of the corals dissolve in like in days. I mean, they are doing stuff. I know back in the uh, 2000, I was involved. They were testing uh, audio stuff off of the Azores. And um, and just because I brought a ship, a Sea Shepherd ship in there, and I was there, I had guys follow me around. I'm going, who are these guys following me around? They go, oh, they're the, uh, the Navy. What do you mean, Navy? What did I do? I mean, this is, I mean, we do a lot of Sea Shepherd, but we hardly ever go against the US Navy. And I'll tell you what, they'll sink you. <laughs> Period. We are blockading the harbor in 1983 in Canada. Just keeps the idea was we're gonna any sealing boat that goes out of St. John's Harbor, we're gonna sink. First of all, we never would have caught them, but nonetheless, we made the point, and we were outside the harbor. Well, they had two Canadian Coast Guard cutters out there watching us. I don't know why, and everybody stayed in the harbor. We tied up the seal hunt for weeks. And during that time, an American, I don't know, I'm not a Navy guy, but an American frigate, a small American warship, a frigate or a small destroyer or something came into the harbor. They were making a call. And we are, so you talk to people. Hi, right, what are you guys doing? Oh, yeah, we're blockading the harbor. <laughs> Excuse me? We're blockading the harbor. Any sealing boat that goes out, we're going to sink them. Can I talk to the captain? Sure. Hey, Paul, he wants to talk to you. Yes, sir, is this Captain? Sir, this is the, uh, whatever, is, he was, this is Captain from the U.S. Navy. I, I forget his name. This is a long time. He said, I just want to inform you, sir, I wouldn't advise blockading an American port. I would have sunk you two weeks ago. And he would have, because American captains can make the decision to fire. The rest of the world has to talk to their government. That's why I'm still alive today. <laughs> And that is absolutely true. You have to make, and what we do, what I know, I'm a television director, I have a flair for the media, uh, but what people bring me to do, even here to Maui to do the reefs, is to get the world involved through media and through tricks. And we're going to use what I call the seal clubbing theory. It wasn't against the law to club seals, it was just friggin' immoral. When so it isn't against the law to steal your fish. It's just immoral. It is your ice park. It is, it is where we should be eating from. It is, it is what brings people to Hawaii to see, to die. It's, you look at the video, it's, you know, where'd you shoot that? Oh, I shot that in Indonesia. That's, I see it all the time. It's used in Hawaii films all the time. They're getting hammered too. But here in Hawaii, you have a chance. You have enough educated, and, and, and people to realize that we can't keep taking from the ocean without giving back. You don't have to stop everything, but we certainly have to bring an appreciation to what is out there. We have to, people have to realize that we don't get a second chance. And I have, like I said, everyone said, I'm here to save the earth. We're not going to save the earth. The earth is just fine. The earth was here when there was ammonia and sulfur and volcanoes, and the earth is cool. What we're doing, no matter how noble you are, is we are saving what is here for us, for, our, for us here, for the future, because if we don't, there is not going to be any future for us. You know, in the, from 1980 to 2045, there will be more species lost than in the last 65 million years. Somebody can look that up, but I did just before I came. <laughs> that's amazing. And it isn't because, and people can say it's global warming. Well, it is global warming in a way, 
But how come no environmental group talks about the 800 pound gorilla in the room, which is population? The Sierra Club almost broke up over the population because some of the guys wanted to talk about population and other people said it was anti-immigrant or anti this. Or, hey, we have to realize that we are part of the planet. The planet Earth is a spaceship. We as humans are on for the ride. We're enjoying the deck, we're having the cocktails, we're dancing to the band, and we are having a ball. But we add nothing to this spaceship. And not only are we having a ball, instead of helping the people who are keeping our water fresh, serving our food, making our food, keeping the hole prepared so we're not going to blow up, all those people, we're just killing off for no reason, just because it's fun, or we can, or financially it's a good deal for me. Well, pretty soon, like the Titanic, this thing's going to start sinking. And it is already sinking. I don't like to be negative, but it is already sinking. And I am one of the individuals, and I like to, in a positive way, I have fun doing it. If you watch my movie, you see how much fun I have. If you, I don't have a problem talking to the bad guys. I actually like it. I love it when they start screaming and yelling at me. I have glasses. I'm little. It's hard to hit me. <laughs> I would worry about the Hawaiians hugging me because they're like 300 pounds and I just about get killed. <laughs> it's like, oh, my Anyhow, um, so I have no problem with that. And I think that everybody has to start confronting people. I mean, here in Hawaii, what's scaring me to death, has anyone heard about Fukushima? That is still throwing radioactive water totally every day into the ocean, and no one's talking about it because we don't know what to do. We humans don't know what to do. And if you look at the NOAA charts, it's coming right here. Why doesn't somebody say something? Instead of fighting in Syria, bombing me, why aren't we over there trying to fill that reactor as a species? We have to, as a species, start looking what is good for us and not as good for the individual. Unfortunately, I come from America, of course, we're very individualistic and all this stuff, but as a species, we have to start watching out. We can't keep destroying everything. It just doesn't work. And the way to not do that is to positively, don't bitch and moan, but get up and do something little. If you see a boat polluting, go and talk to the guy. You don't have to sink the boat. That's the second time. He doesn't. <laughs> Talk to him the first time. As I always say, we always ask people politely not to wail before we whack them. I, I'm much more polite than Paul Watson. I say, please, will you take your boats out of here and stop whaling? He says, get your boats out of here. Get back out. I'm much more polite. But I think you have to give them a chance. And I think we have to we have to approach the other side. We as environmentalists and environmental here as an environmental group. I don't know if you guys are all involved with them or not. But as an environmental group, we have to go out and and meet other people. We have to bring other groups in. We can't bitch about them because they're not doing it the way we want. Forget about our you know, differences. We have to focus on what we all can do, and we all can do something. Everybody, whether you're a writer, you can write. If you're a school teacher, you can teach. If you're a diver, you can make sure people respect the ocean. If you, any number of things one can do. And you will find when you do it with vigor, <laughs> your friends will follow. And they won't even dislike you unless you're a real pain in the ass. Someone will dislike you because you kind of become a pain in the ass. But if you can do it with good humor and not be so crazy, I mean, I even know some nice vegans that aren't so crazy. <laughs> and, um, and I'm going to finish this up in just a minute so you can ask some questions, but I will tell you a little vegan joke. In the old days, when we used to go, in the, we really had poor stuff. We didn't even have food, rice and beans. And we kept our protein because the rice always had weevils and weevils in it. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. We had no refrigeration, so we'd go out, we'd have fresh vegetables for two days, and then literally rice and beans every single day. One time we drank World War II water because we ran out of fresh water, we had canned. I mean, it was just, this was like crazy. So we get in, of course, me, I jump off the ship first because I had a job. And I used to have film, and we wanted to get it off before it could get confiscated by the authorities. I mean, in the old days, that was a big deal. You couldn't ship it out from had to, it was film. You had to get the stuff off the boat, get it processed, and then get it out. So I jump the minute I jump off and run to. Actually, I run to the most expensive hotel in town. That was always my gag. And I walk in, and then I bring the vegans over so they could shower because we didn't have showers. And boy, these. And and then I take them to dinner. 
And it was easy, because all they could eat was peas. <laughs> I used to say, oh, I'm mistaken. My friends, they'll have peas. <laughs> and not only that, they enjoyed them, because they were better than rice and beans. So anyhow, just I'd like to leave you the thing that um, anybody needs help from me, I'll be very happy. If you would like to look at my film, I, like I said, I think you can get it free on the internet, but you can go to my site, enemyfilm.tv, one word, and it's in four or five different languages, and I'm making another. But the only thing about my film is, is how we trick, you know, how we fooled everybody into thinking we were bigger than we are. Well, now we are.